Well, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to worship here at Woodlawn United Church on uh, this Sunday that when uh, we reserve some time uh, to observe uh, uh, the sacrifice of so many uh, made on our behalf and on behalf of others. And so as we gather in this place this morning, a warm welcome to each of you, to those who are watching online, and especially uh, a warm welcome to any veterans and ones who have served either actively uh, or otherwise who are here in our midst. And I invite you, if you are able, just to please stand for a moment so we might acknowledge you here in our midst. Those who have served, please stand. And so, thank you. Please be seated. And I do want to uh, say uh, thank you to, to uh, Watson and to Terry and to Keith uh, and to Martin for their participation in the service today. Uh, it is very much appreciated and we are grateful uh, that you are willing to be a part of this worship time in such a way. And friends, as we gather in this place, we remember with gratitude uh, that we live and worship on lands that are by law the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. And so may we live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. Uh, I do have uh, one pastoral announcement to share this morning, uh, and uh, we extend Christian sympathies to the uh, family and the friends of Tom Inkpen. Uh, Tom died just past week, and we hold all who mourn his loss, uh, especially his wife Kay, uh, in our prayers at this time. And uh, may you know that you are being held in prayer uh, to those who are the family and uh, friends of Tom as you mourn his loss. Uh, announcements are sent out each week with the bulletin. We're slowly going to start rolling out bulletins again for people to have here in person, but they're also emailed each week with the uh, included announcements. And if you do not receive those, uh, we invite you to contact the office so that we might add you to our mailing list so you're aware of what's going on. Uh, just to note today that following our remembrance observance, uh, following the national anthem, that young people are invited to uh, head downstairs with Maggie Healy. Maggie, you can just give a wave. She'll be up here at the front, and you can find your way down for our children's and youth programming uh, after we sing O Canada this morning. Are there any other announcements that people have to share before we continue? Then uh, just to say thank you for the way you continue to be the church through this pandemic time as we continue to, to get back to church and uh, seek to be the church in spite of all the challenges uh, that we may continue to adapt and to grow and to be the church uh, for the world in our day and our age. read the response of our call to worship this morning, and I invite you to stand as you are able. Jesus said, if you are tired from carrying heavy burdens, come to me and I will give you rest. Take the yoke I give you, put it on your shoulders and learn from me. I am gentle and humble, and you will find rest. This yoke is easy to bear. And the burden is light. Christ invites us to lay down our burdens, to rest from the things that are troubling us, and learn what Christ-like love can do, to pause and pray about what we can offer to others, and how we can transform the world with our service. Let us gather in the name of the eternal God, who shows us the way to life. And I invite us to join our voices in the singing of our first hymn, number 256 in the hymn book, O God Beyond All Praising. And the words will also be on the screen.
As we gather in this place, we gather in the light of Christ. Jesus comes to be a light to the world with a light that shines in us and a light that shines for us, illuminating the way to everlasting life. As we welcome this light into our lives, let us also welcome a moment of sacred silence as we bow our heads and breathe deeply. O oh God, we gather as your people in this sanctuary today. And each of us comes as we are individuals with our own lives and our own concerns. We come from a world where there are distractions. There is much that can cause fear and anxiety and worry. Much that can drive a wedge between our ourselves and others. Yet here in this place, you call us together May we be open to the movement of your spirit that draws closer to us, that we might indeed draw closer to one another in a spirit of love, of justice, of truth, and peace, that we might be drawn together in the way of Christ Jesus, the one in whose name we pray and the one whose prayer we say together as we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I invite you to stand for the processing of the colors this morning. And as we continue to mark our Remembrance Day observance, uh, let us sing the words of our next hymn, God as with silent hearts.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Remembrance Sunday. While I was standing up there uh, waiting to uh, come up and talk, listening to the choir, I saw this uh, older, gray-haired gentleman looking at me, straight at me, and I realized I was looking at myself in the mirror. <laughs> Time marches on. <laughs> so on November 11th, coming up, we have the opportunity to remember the efforts of those special Canadians who sacrificed their lives, their spirits, their health, their emotional well-being during both World Wars, Korea, Gulf War, Afghanistan, and the numerous UN and coalition-led conflicts and policing actions all around the globe. In remembrance, we pay homage to those who responded to their country's needs. On that day, we traditionally pause for silent tribute and attend commemorative ceremonies in memory of those who have passed on. Due to the realities of COVID-19 we and Delta and I don't know what variants will be coming, we have seen changes to these ceremonies, but can still remember that over 100,000 Canadians paid the ultimate sacrifice. If you're unable to attend a public ceremony, please take the time to stop and honour those who gave so much for us. Perhaps watch the televised national ceremony or just take a moment at your household to say a few words. If we don't remember their sacrifice, those lives lose, lose uh, much of their meaning. We must never forget that they gave their very future so we may live in peace. They died for Canada, lest we forget. It's the custom of Woodlawn United Church to gather on Sunday before Remembrance Day to recognize all these men and women. Uh, on the screen, you should see the uh, honor roll coming up. It's the most up-to-date list we have of current serving, uh, past members, and the honor roll of those who have passed on. Uh, if there's a member of this congregation whose name doesn't appear in this list, um, who should be there, please contact the church office to have it uh, amended, and we'll get them on the, uh, on the list. We also take the opportunity to, opportunity to recognize anyone in the co congregation who are uh, veterans, those military RCMP still on active service, and the retired members of the military and RCMP. In addition, Special recognition is made to those veterans on the honor roll who have passed away. So if you would just hold your appreciation to the end. Uh, without further ado, I would invite any veterans present, members of the military or RCMP who are retired or still on active duty to please rise. Any of you please rise. Gentlemen, please. Ladies and gentlemen, these are some of the people that work to keep our country free. Um, thank you very much. In conclusion, I'd like to thank you for your attendance on this special day. It means a lot for us and for your acknowledgement of these special members of your church community. Thank you.
Now I invite the choir to remain standing and I invite everyone else to stand as you are able uh, for the placing of the wreath, the last post, silence, words of remembrance, and the rouse and then the singing of O Canada. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them.
also invite any young people who are present to please uh, follow uh, Maggie downstairs. Uh, Maggie will meet you there at the front corner of the sanctuary and you can make your way down. And when the colors are, are recessed at the end of the service, the uh, wreath will be placed on a table in the narthex and you are invited to leave your poppies there uh, with the wreath. You're also invited to stay afterwards for a fellowship time in the hall downstairs where coffee and tea will be served. And uh, while the colors are being uh, recessed out of the sanctuary, please stand, but then uh, be seated uh, for the postlude and an usher will let you know when it is time to exit. So thank you. In our text this morning, Jesus made what scholars refer to as the farewell discourse. It comes when the arrest, trial, and execution of Jesus is imminent. Jesus wanted his disciples to not only remember him, but remain connected to him, to abide in him, and know the spiritual connection that would endure long and after he had laid down his life. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 5 to 13. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withered. Some branches are gathered, thrown into fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandments, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Here ended the reading. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Terry. Let us pray. Eternal and everlasting God in whom we live and move and have our being. As we gather in this sanctuary to offer our deepest prayers, our hymns of praise, as we stop to remember lives that have been given blood that has been shed for us. We pray, O oh God, that uh, through words that have been prepared and pondered, through the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts, that we might find anew your word for us. May it be a word of life, a word of hope, a word of peace. May it be the same word we encounter in Christ Jesus, for it is in his name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so
So Remembrance Day is one of those days in the year when we are afforded an opportunity to consider the many who sacrificed and served for the sake of others. Uh, individuals who gave their lives for people they never knew, for people who never knew them. You know, I, I've asked people from time to time, you know, can you name someone who has served in the First World War? And more often than not, by a, a large margin, most people cannot. And you see, I ask people that question not because I want them to feel guilty about not knowing, but to me it's about realizing how for us, with the growing years between you know, conflicts of the past, we can appreciate how time creates a distance. And because of this distance, we may not feel the personal connection. I mean, I can, you know, imagine back during the years immediately following the First World War, I mean, given the number of Canadians who served, it would have been easy for someone uh, to name a relative who had not only served, but had possibly been wounded or killed. Because they experienced those sacrifices firsthand. There was a personal connection. I mean, this is a connection that many of us can have a hard time making so many years later. I mean, Jesus, he was aware of, you know, just the challenge of staying connected with the passage of time. But Jesus also knew the importance of staying connected and what it would mean. I mean, in this text that Terry read for us this morning, as he noted, Jesus is nearing the end of his time with his disciples. And he wants to leave his disciples with an image. An image of their connection. Of how he is the vine and they are the branches. And how they are meant to abide in him. I mean, in many respects, the disciples were already aware of their connection to the uh, to Jesus. I mean, they knew him personally. They'd been following Jesus for some time, listening to him, eating with him, watching him. They shared that deep personal relationship we might call friendship. But Jesus knew the day was coming when he would no longer be with them the way he used to be. And he doesn't just want his disciples to remember him. They, he wants his disciples to abide in him. To remain in him. And know that even after his death, there would still be this enduring spiritual connection. And in the laying down of his life for them, Jesus is hoping they will come to appreciate just how special the connection is. Just how powerful the love is. He says, you know, climactically to his disciples in this discourse, he says, no one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. I mean, for Jesus, what connects him to his disciples is the energy of this love. That, and it's made known through a particular kind of sacrifice. Right through that personal sacrifice that one makes for another. And this is important because you see back then, uh, sacrifice was different. The sacrifice that most people would have been accustomed to. You know, then Jews would go to the temple and as a part of religious observances, they wouldn't make personal sacrifices, they sacrificed animals. I mean, even the Romans, they practiced animal sacrifice, and they were also known, the Romans, to make human sacrifices. But those kinds of sacrifices bore little or no cost on the individual who was making them, because they were offering the life of another. And thus, so you see, when Jesus speaks of willingly laying down his own life for another, it's about bearing that personal cost. Right? The kind of sacrifice Jesus had to make because without it, his disciples would never know the power of that love that leads to resurrection. 
They would never know this kind of love and what it could do. They would never know how a personal sacrifice willingly made for the sake of others, that's the kind of sacrifice that gives way to life. It's the kind of sacrifice that's from the inside out. And it's so deep and so mysterious. You know, many of us struggle with what it really means to have someone else sacrifice for us. Especially sacrifice their life for us. It can make you uncomfortable when you really think about it. Why? I think it's one reason is because it's a sacrifice. Well, it's not a sacrifice I've asked for. I mean, the disciples never asked Jesus to make the sacrifice he was about to make. In fact, many of them rallied against it, and they would often try to talk him out of it. And I think the same can be said about many of us as we look back into history on the ones who volunteered, ones who went off to war, ones who experienced horrors and brutality in the battlefield, ones who never returned we can look back and say, well, I never asked them to make that sacrifice. So, what does it matter? Well, I can say that even though we may not have asked them, we all do benefit from the sacrifice that was made. And I say that not to glorify war, but to glorify the sacrifices that are made for our sake. You know, for my sake, for the sake of so many. I mean, would we know life as we know it? Would we enjoy the freedoms we share as a country? You know, would we have this life of relative peace without sacrifice? I mean, there are many who have difficulty with these questions. I mean, taking seriously this, you know, sacrifice made for me or for us. It can lead to a whole host of feelings. And I think one of the feelings we can experience is guilt. I uh, remember reading an article that was posted on the CBC News and it and identified this very thing. The article described the, the reaction of uh, test audiences to advertisements that had been uh, created by the Department of Veterans Affairs to commemorate Remembrance Day. And the advertisements, uh, some of them never made it into wider circulation because of how the test groups responded. And one of the ads was called The Torch, and it was a collection of illustrations, and it was set to a reading of In Flanders Fields. And those test groups who saw the ad said that watching it made them feel guilty. And it was especially true, and I found this interesting, of younger audiences. Now, the article didn't spell out why, and I can only speculate. But one thing I, I'm pretty certain of is I don't believe that the ones who gave their lives in the service of others did so that we might experience guilt. I mean, lest we begin to distort their motivations and the nature of the sacrifice they have made for us. I mean, I appreciate that there are times in this world when the motivation to sacrifice is to make another person feel guilty. I've witnessed it. I'm sure you have too. Examples of ones, you know, who will sacrifice themselves in an attempt to make themselves into a martyr or in order to make someone else feel guilty. But those are sacrifices that have little to do with love for another. You know, I remember watching this play out between the, in a relationship between the uh, two daughters of some friends of mine. They had two daughters, one was older and one was younger, and the older sister was constantly hounding her younger, younger sister, telling her younger sister how she always had to clean up after her, how because of this she never got to play as much. You know, she went out of her way to make her little sister appear as being some sort of burden. And whether she realized it or not, in a way, you know, she was trying to make herself out as some sort of martyr. And she wanted her little sister to feel guilty. And from what I remember quite comically, 
The younger sister just remained oblivious, right? It was quite funny, actually. Uh, and it actually only served to uh, expose the vanity of the older sister's behavior. Right? But sadly, you know, there are other instances in this world where people are controlled by guilt or think they are supposed to feel guilty when another sacrifices for them, that that's what they're supposed to feel. And you see, that's a terrible thing because guilt is a powerful and a destructive weapon in our world. I mean, it's true that there are ones who will sacrifice because they want others to feel guilt and not grace. But as I said, those are sacrifices people make for their own sake and not for the sake of the love of another. Right? That's not the spirit of Christ's own sacrifice. I mean, it was not guilt, as our text tells us. It was love. No greater love. You know, as it says elsewhere in John's Gospel, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn it, but in order that it might have everlasting life. For God knows, you know, better than anyone that driving people into guilt and remaining in guilt never leads to life. I mean, desiring someone into guilt, that's not the sign of a healthy relationship. It's not a sign of wholeness. Right? When Jesus gave himself to sacrifice, it was to show the way to life. How sacrifice can bring the freedom of resurrection and not the weight of guilt. I mean, that's the thing about sacrifice I find in relation to Christ's own sacrifice that is so often misunderstood. I mean, and Jesus knew that the day would come when the nature of his sacrifice could very well be misunderstood because he encountered it with his own disciples who never wanted him to sacrifice. Thus, you know, the image of the vine and the branches and the instruction to abide in him was so important. Eight times in this chapter, Jesus says, abide in me and my love. Right? If his disciples were to forget that deeper personal connection and relationship, they would soon forget the true nature and shape of Christ and his sacrifice. To take that reference from Flanders in Flanders Fields, Jesus did not want them to break faith with him when he died. And he wanted them to hold that torch of love and abide in the love that transforms what a sacrifice means. You see, on Remembrance Day, something we celebrate, I mean, something that's hard to comprehend and sometimes understand is what do we make of the sacrifices of soldiers' lives for so many? What do we make of sacrifices we never asked for by ones we likely do not know or have forgotten? Men and women with unique stories, ones who willingly put their lives on the line for a cause greater than themselves. Well, we are called to be humble. We are called to graciously accept their sacrifice. In a sense, that's a part of our sacrifice. Because their sacrifice in many cases, seemed so final and really appeared to hold no obvious reward. I can't imagine being out in a fight and not knowing that there could be an end in sight. You know, and even for us, we know that humanity is still given way to its warring ways. What, what does it mean? The idea that anyone could give up everything for people he or she didn't even know that's hard to process. Because we spend much of our lives trying to gain, trying to acquire, trying to win, pleasing ourselves. 
right? Contemplating how our freedom to live as we please comes at the expense of another can very easily lead us to guilt. And thus, in an effort to avoid or alleviate the guilt, we may just choose to not remember and ignore the whole thing. I mean, we should take this tension seriously as a people of faith. Wrestle with that mystery of how uh, the sacrificial death of Jesus somehow makes a difference and makes us free. Because deep down we can deny the sacrifice because maybe it's because we are called to make our own sacrifices. Yes, you know, it may seem at times pointless to act out of faith in the service of others. Because many do remain oblivious to the sacrifices others have made on their behalf. Sacrifices that can become distorted, forgotten. But as we choose to sacrifice in the way of Christ, we take full advantage of the freedom found in him. Including the freedom to appreciate the value of what others have done for us. Sacrifices made in a spirit of love and of friendship that's eternal. I mean, I hope we can take this understanding of sacrifice to heart when we think about what it means to live, you know, to live out some of those pledges made at the climate change con uh, conference this past week. You know, what does it mean for us to sacrifice now? You know, to connect from the heart with future generations out of a spirit of friendship. You know, that we and they may abide in that same spirit. You know, that we may pass the torch instead of the buck. So hopefully future generations can come to appreciate the value of how sacrifice can lead to life. I mean, in terms of Remembrance Day, uh, you know, I, I read about the story uh, someone shared with me this past week of a group of high school students who were taking the time to actually name, uh, learn the names of the fallen, of some fallen. And as a part of a school project, they were each assigned to research the life of a soldier from the First World War. And they chose soldiers by names, you know, soldiers with names like Roy McKay and, and uh, George Chisholm, uh, Cedric Harrop and others. Men who were from and, and, and fought and died who were from this country and from their communities. And the students, you know, began to make personal connections. They reached out to descendants and relatives, learned about lives, time spent in captivity, torture endured, poems that they had written, hopes they had, like the hope that it would be the only war. Students said because of what they learned, they didn't experience guilt. They experienced more empathy for those who had been through war, a deeper connection to their own community and their own day and age, gratitude for ones who served. I mean, you could sense from reading the story and hearing the stories of the, the young people how the lives of those soldiers were abiding in those students. And the students had made space to abide in those soldiers. You see, just as Jesus said to his disciples, I am the vine and you are the branches, and abide in me and I will abide in you, we pause, we remember sacrifices made because in so doing we receive a renewed sense of our common humanity. We remember the individuals, their sacrifices, their love for one another, their love for us. A sacrifice none of us asked for but like all sacrifices that are made out of love made by ones who laid down their lives for their friends, including us, we know ourselves to be richer because of this connection. So we honor their sacrifice and make that our sacrifice today. The freedom we have 
in part because of them is to make this sacrifice and to give thanks and contemplate with gratitude how others have given of themselves for us in order that we can abide in them and they in us. And in so doing, may we abide in the Spirit of Christ, the one in whom God has shown us all no greater love Thanks be to God.
I invite you to stand as you are able as we acknowledge the offerings we make today to support the life and the work of the church both here and around the globe. Please stand for our offertory response. Let us pray. Great and glorious Savior, we listen attentively to your voice that we might abide in you and you in us. And so we generously give in gratitude for your truth made known on our spiritual journey. We pray that the gifts we give may help others to see the grace of your kingdom, to draw closer to you and find a greater peace. We pray in the name of the one who showed no greater love than the sacrifice made in love. Amen. I invite you to be seated. And let us gather our hearts and minds in our pastoral prayers today. Let us pray. O holy God, our help in ages past and our hope for years to come. You are with us in all times of life. You seek to offer hope and light and comfort. You do not abandon us. Instead, you give us the gift of your very self to show us no greater love. So give us the grace to abide in your spirit that great spirit that abide, abided in your son, Jesus, who revealed a love without equal as he laid down his life for his friends, even us. So may it be grace and not guilt that inspires us to faith and to life. May we be moved to gratitude, gratitude for a life-giving gift, As we approach our National Day of Remembrance, may we experience this gratitude in so many ways, especially for ones who gave themselves in ways that are difficult to fathom. In spite of the passage of time, in spite of the fact that we may not even know their names, allow the personal nature of their sacrifice to abide in us as we remember them. That we might offer thanks for our freedom, Thanks for our peace. Thanks for our prosperity and our security. Oh God, you give us so much to be grateful for. No less than your very presence and power in our midst. As we look around, we give thanks for this day, for the gifts of family, of friends, for this family of faith of which we are called to be a part. Think of the ways your love is made known to us, especially through those who have been and are there for us in good times and in tough times. So we thank you for those people. We thank you for the opportunities to help and serve others, uh, to find that food of the Spirit that fills our souls. To you, Lord of life, we also bring prayers of concern. Prayers for so many who dwell in this wonder of creation you have given for us to steward and to keep. And so we bring these prayers in the faith you have also given for us to steward and to keep. To you who seeks justice and mercy, we pray for all who are wronged and neglected and we pray for those who work and suffer to right wrongs we 
pray for those in this world who are underprivileged, for ones who cannot find a, a safe, affordable home to live in, both far away and close to home. We pray for ones who are blinded because they are overprivileged. We pray for the victims in this world where natural disasters have struck, where people are left to pick up pieces, and we pray for those who help them to rebuild. We pray for the victims and for the perpetrators of war that peace might not only be seen as a dream, but as an absolute reality. We offer prayers for the diseased, the badly injured, the anxious and the despairing. We pray for ones with hearts that grieve. We also hold in prayer caregivers and all your human agents of healing and comfort. We pray for ones who bravely serve on the front lines for the sake of others. We pray for veterans whose memories are stirred. Ones who remember firsthand experiences, the faces and the names of fallen comrades and friends for ones who bear the scars of conflict. We pray for the members of our armed forces, wherever they may be. O oh God of all nations, as we pray for our country, we pray we be remade into a people of peace and that our prayers might be transformed, ones that are spoken aloud and the ones too deep for words. For you, O oh God, know how much these prayers mean. May they mean as much to us as we seek to share them together and abide in Christ Jesus, the one in whose name we pray. Amen. And I invite you to stand that we might sing the words of our closing hymn for the healing of the nations. Thank you.
to a world loved by God, whose image lies at the heart of all people and peoples. By God's grace, may we recognize the Spirit's presence in words of truth, things of beauty and actions of love about us. May others see in us and we in others the image of the Christ who has called us to be neighbors and friends. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may our Lord shower you with kindness and give you peace. Amen.